Good evening. I call this June 29, 2021 virtual administrative meeting of the Bernalillo County Commissioners to order. And let me just remind you that this is our last Zoom meeting, our last meeting before our July break. The next time we meet will be in person on August 17th in our new chambers at Alvarado Square. And so before we move on, I would like to just take this time to acknowledge the tragic loss this past week to our APS and ballooning communities, as well as to the many lives that were touched by the victims of the balloon crash on Saturday. I know Commissioner O'Malley would like to say a few words and then lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, during this moment of silence, of course, that we do ask that, that uh, we uh, send uh, our uh, thoughts and prayers uh, for peace and for comfort to the families of the victims of this tragic balloon uh, accident. Um, this was a gift, as many of you probably heard about, to Susan Montoya, and she was an assistant principal with APS. This was a gift from her colleagues. This is something she'd wanted to do for a long time. So her husband, John, was also with her. He was a special education assistant at Sandia High. Mary Martinez, she's a Valley High grad and she volunteers with the North Valley Center. Uh, she was also with her husband. They were friends of, uh, of the um, Montoyas. His name was Martin. He's a retired APD officer with APS Police Force. And um, also the uh, balloon uh, pilot who is very experienced, who, um, who has a son. Uh, he's a counselor at John Baker Elementary School. Uh, with APS as well. This is very, very sad, and I know the community is grieving. And so, um, if you would join me in a moment of silence, and then we'll follow with the pledge. Please join me in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible. Did I just miss one thing? <laughs> no. Am I going doing good? <laughs> Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. For something, for some reason, I thought I missed a section. Uh, liberty and justice for all. I guess that's it. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner <laughs> O'Malley. Thank you. Um, and moving on, Madam County Manager, are there any changes or additions to the agenda? Madam Chair and Commissioners, good evening. There's only one, and that's the minutes of the June 15th, 2021 meeting. If we could defer that to the August 17th meeting and a vote is required for that change. Thank you. Okay, I will make a motion to defer the minutes. Do I have a second? Commissioner O'Malley, thank you. All in favor? And Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Barboa. Aye. Commissioner Benson. Aye. Commissioner O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So thank you very much. Moving on to proclamations. Um, I am sponsoring the fireworks safety proclamation that I'd like to read now with 4th of July swiftly approaching this weekend. Um, from the Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners. Whereas Bernalillo County is enduring a, a historic drought with areas rated by the US Drought Monitor as severe, extreme, and exceptional. And whereas the drought is accompanied by above average temperatures and below average pr precipitation in the driest areas. And whereas the water supply in the county is measured by stream flow ranges from below normal much below normal to low, and whereas the risk of wildfires is high. Stage two fire restrictions are in effect in the Cibola National Forest, and open burning is banned in the unincorporated areas of Bernalillo County. And whereas each year fireworks cause thousands of fires in the US, resulting in loss of life, injury, devastation of wildlands, and over 100 
million dollars in direct property damage. And whereas data suggests that 28% of fires started by fireworks in recent years were reported on July 4th, and whereas fireworks are also deeply disturbing to animals and to people who suffer from PTSD. And whereas the county is hosting and invites residents to view the July 4th public fireworks displays at Tom Tenorio Park and the city of Albuquerque is presenting fireworks displays at Balloon Fiesta Park, North Domingo Baca Park, Expo New Mexico and Ladera Golf Course. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners bans the use, possession, storage, and handling of the following fireworks. Aerial devices, aerial spinners, helicopters, missile-type rockets, stick-type rockets, Roman candles, ground audible devices, chasers and firecrackers, and calls upon all residents to be mindful of the extreme fire danger in the county and the dangers posed by fireworks. Done this 29th day of June, 2021 in Bernalillo County, state of New Mexico and signed by all the commissioners. And Chief Perez, can you speak to this a little bit um, about some of the, the dangers of fireworks and also what is banned? Um, because I think a lot of people think because they see fireworks being sold that they must be legal in Bernalillo County. So can you talk about that a little? So Madam Chair, Commissioners, first let me thank you by bringing this proclamation forward tonight. Um, I know with all of the rain that's happening and the fact we just had a swift water team dispatched down to Eddy County who's experiencing flooding, we, we tend to, to assume that just this little bit of rain will be enough to kind of get us out of this drought that we've been prepping and experiencing over the last number of years. So uh, it's important that we make sure folks are aware of the dangers that come along with any kind of open fire, especially in dry conditions. And as we approach the 4th of July, knowing how to celebrate that 4th of July uh, festivities in a way that's safe and doesn't cause undue harm or loss to anyone within the community. So by ordinance, there are a number of devices that are no longer uh, allowed within Bernalillo County. And anybody within the city of Albuquerque or the limits of Bernalillo County who is selling fireworks are selling only those that are actually legal to be to be set off on the 4th of July. If individuals are purchasing fireworks outside of Bernalillo County, those are more than likely fireworks that are going to be illegal and could be uh, faced with a fine of $1,000 or up to a year in jail or both if caught using those type of aerial devices. So I, I think the best gauge rather than me sit and try to explain every one of them that, that you are uh, allowed to or not to use, if you're buying an aerial device, chances outside of Bernalillo County's limits, chances are it's illegal and you could get yourself into a whole lot of trouble with it. Uh, the, the fireworks that are allowable are ones that don't leave the ground. Um, the fountains are about the only ones that are allowed to be utilized that shoot any kind of flame into the air. Um, but those of you who have seen fountains, they don't go out of control. They stay in one place and shoot, a, shoot colors up um, no more than, I think it's five to seven feet. Um, little sparklers that you that you hold around and we've used as kids, those are still uh, able to be used. The wheels that you might put on a post that kind of spin, those kind of things are all safe and are what you should be finding within the fireworks to, uh, tents and stores around the Bernalillo County area. Again, anything that you're purchasing outside of the uh, county limits, you run a really high risk that it's illegal within Bernalillo County. So again, we just ask everybody to be very mindful um, of your neighbors. I think uh, Commissioner Piscotti, you also hit on uh, the loud aerial devices. Those are definitely um, not loud aerial devices, but the ground, the ground ordinance type devices. Those are extremely disturbing to pets and people with PTSD and pose a huge danger to the individuals who are lighting them. Um, numerous people lose hands and fingers um, as a result of trying to light those type of M80 and larger type uh, ground devices. So just use caution, use safety. If you are gonna have fireworks, you're gonna enjoy the legal ones. Make sure you do so with a water source close to you and you do it in an area that's open and free from any kind of risk of igniting something. And in the event that something does ignite, quickly call 911 and we'll do our best to get there and take care of the issue. And I hope that helps, Commissioner. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And of course, we want everybody to have a, a fun and relaxing 4th of July weekend and also safe in terms of we want everybody's house to survive. We want um, animals, people to feel comfortable. And we, we also want to make sure that um, our first responders are safe. So um, yes, if people we can will, refrain from fireworks. We, we will be stepping up all of our patrols starting on the first. Um, we'll have extra brush trucks and patrols in the East Mountains and our portion of the Bosque as well as throughout the streets and neighborhoods. Um, especially on, on the 4th of July evening, we will have a, a very strong presence out and about within the community. So we'll do everything on our side and we are well prepared to deal with whatever may come. But we do wish everybody a very safe and enjoyable 4th of July. This is one that will be back to some amount of normalcy where we can enjoy one another's company once again. We just ask that everybody do that safely from a COVID side as well as uh, from the firework safety as well. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to public comment. Julianne, how many have signed up to speak? Madam Chair, uh, we have received one sign up this evening um, and we also received um, two written comments. So we have Ms. Edie Ward to provide public comment. Okay, so um, I'll just read the instructions. You will have 90 seconds to share your comments. You will then be notified when your time is up. You will then be muted and moved to the waiting room. Should any of the commissioners have follow-up questions to your comments, you will have an opportunity to answer. So Ms. Ward, um, go ahead, you have 90 seconds. Madam Chairwoman and commissioners, a 2017 study analyzing tax incentives in New Mexico found that those focused on economic development are often costly and ineffective, insufficiently disclosed, and poorly monitored. Questions to ask include the following. Is the touted job creation really that, or will the position simply move workers from one area of the county to another? Are the touted jobs living wage and higher wage jobs? Will the incentives serve the purpose of public-private investments in an infill area in need of revitalization? Or will the incentive give a tax break for fringe greenfield development that would happen anyway? Will the incentive put tax pressure on other taxpayers for the decreased receipts and lost opportunity costs of held funds? Will the incentive favor a large out-of-state business interest in competition with locally owned businesses? With regard to item 8C, whether the total dollar amount is $700,000 or more than $1.4 million, and please clarify that, the amount is trifling to a multi-billion dollar company and potentially very meaningful to Bernalillo County taxpayers in need of a little assistance. My remarks will continue later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ward. And so moving on, Economic Development South Valley Main Street Annual Presentation. Mei Ling, please introduce this item. Hi, good evening, um, Commissioner. This is, I'm Mei Ling, I'm the Director of Economic Development and we're doing our annual um, presentation of South Valley Main Street and here to present is uh, Bianca Encinias. And so I'll hand it over to Bianca. You're on mute. Hi, thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Bianca Encinas and I'm the Executive Director of the South Valley Main Street. I am going to see if that's okay if I can share my screen. Okay, so again, my name is Bianca Encinas and I'm the Executive Director of the South Valley Main Street. The South Valley Main Street is a partnership between the New Mexico Main Street, which is a office within the state New Mexico Office of Economic Development, Bernalillo County, and the nonprofit, the South Valley Main Street. What our goals are, is to do community-based economic redevelopment, and we are required to follow the four-point strategy for community transformation as outlined by the New Mexico Main Street and the National Main Street, which takes an assets-based approach. So that four-point strategy is economic vitality, design, organization, and promotion, all with the goal of community transformation. 
this map that you see right here in front of you is the, the South Valley Main Street District, which is on Bridge Boulevard and parts of Asleta Boulevard. It is within a MRA district, which, which is a metropolitan redevelopment area. What we wanted to highlight was some of the work that we've done in the past year from July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. So our year in review. So one of our main strategies is to focus on commercial and residential redevelopment. So for example, as a nonprofit, we're able to secure grants from private foundations to assist local com commercial property owners to rehabilitate their property. As you can see here in 2019, there was a chain link fence on this commercial property. We secured a grant and we were able to build them a cinder block wall in 2020. And then in 2021, we were able to stucco that wall. What this does is we're investing in our community. We're asset building and working with local families. And many of these commercial property owners on Bridge Boulevard are women. Another aspect that we do as part of our facade and building really development and why it's important to have a partnership with the New Mexico Main Street is that they provide technical assistance to us. So they provide architects as consultants for us, which the state pays for, and they work with commercial property owners to revision the facade of their properties. So here is an example of two commercial properties that we worked with this year. And these are the architectural renderings which were developed through those community meetings. So this is what it looks like currently, uh, lower here with the multicolored yawning, and on the top is what we're proposing that it looks like, working with those community members. Here's another perspective. So this was, was developed by a consultant who works with the state of New Mexico. Here's another example, Chavez Karate. This is an example of what their building could look like in the future with building them a wall, redesigning their facade, redeveloping their parking lot. So that's just one component of our facade redevelopment. Another aspect of our work is we provide small business support and technical assistance. In the fiscal year of 2020 to 2021, we were able to secure funding in the amount of $69,744. And that money basically went directly to the community. 3,800 of it went to e-commerce, 40,000 of it went directly to small businesses, whether it was through shopping local, PPP supplies, or providing technical assistance or direct small business grants during COVID-19. We were also able to provide over $6,000 to farmers in the South Valley. We were also able to provide beautification grants to some of the local businesses. As part of our work that we were doing, uh, we were also able to contract with some businesses in the city of Albuquerque, where we spent over $11,000. And through all of this work that we did, we created some community temporary jobs where we spent over $6,000 hiring delivery drivers to distribute food bags and backpacks filled with school supplies to community members. Another way that we were able to provide small business technical assistance as we worked with the New Mexico Main Street who provided a website consultant and we were able to develop six websites for six local businesses, some brick and mortar and some are South Valley business owners who attend the La Familia Growers Market. So here's a listing of all of the businesses that we were able to create websites from them from Bees Honey to Dirty Truck Jerky, the Munchie Truck to Agricultura Network. Another component of the work that we do is that we work with Bernalillo County and the New Mexico Main Street, and we work with our local New Mexico legislative representatives to secure out capital outlay for Bernalillo County. So this year, in the fiscal year 2021, we were able to secure $200,000 in capital outlay. 150,000 of it would go, if you look here to your right, you'll see an architectural rendering of bus shelters that will be built some of them have already been built and they'll be installed on Bridge Boulevard once the construction is over. And to the left, we secured 50,000 this year for some redesign improvements to Dolores Huerta Gateway Park. Here are some more perspectives of what those bus shelters will look like on Bridge Boulevard. At this point, we've secured all the funding for phase one and phase two um, for the bus shelters on Bridge Boulevard. Here are also some more renderings of the Dolores Huerta Gateway Park. And I just wanna flag um, 
that these bottom renderings and the top ones were through previous years of other capital outlay that we secured to contract with MRWM, where we went through a community-based process where we developed the vision for these bus shelters, as well as the redesign of Dolores Worth the Gateway Park. Another project that we've been working on is um, we have done and completed the first phase of the El Camino Real Resiliency Historic Marker Walking Tour. So it focuses on a secular culture, cultural lifeways, Dolores Huerta and the river crossing. We actually just printed these, um, these historic markers and two of them have been installed at the Dolores Huerta Gateway Park. And the next two weeks, the final two historic markers will be installed. So what this does, it creates an opportunity for people to learn about the history of the area and also encourages people to exercise and to walk around the park while visiting local businesses. A new project that we kicked off this year based on a community survey that we did last year right before COVID-19 hit is we partnered with Habitat for Humanity to implement an aging in place minor exterior home repairs pilot project, specifically in the South Valley in the unincorporated area. Here's a flyer that was distributed throughout the community, inviting community members to participate. We are very thankful to Bernalillo County, specifically Enrico Gatti and George Schroeder, who provided with us with the seed funding to pilot this program. And here are some examples of some of the housing rehabilitation that we have done for senior citizens from cleaning their yards to painting their porches. Here are some before and after pictures of painting their houses, helping to fix their roofs a little bit. Here's an example of a home where they had a severe issue with hoarding um, and, and there was some zoning compliance issues. Um, fortunately, we were able to assist this couple and we were able to not only help them clean their front yard, but the sides of their yards and the backyards and work with Bernalillo County to ensure that they were in compliance from a zoning perspective. Then this is another example of a, a trailer that we were able to rehabilitate. It's kind of hard to see in these photos, but we were able to build new stairs. Um, they didn't have a second set of stairs, which is really important in case of an emergency. So that way they have a second door to exit the home, as well as cleaning their yard and painting the outside. Here's just another example. So far we've completed six homes, we have four more to go as a part of this pilot project. If any of you are interested, we could send you the report that came out of the community survey. And once this project is completed with Habitat for Humanity, um, we'll be issuing a report in early fall of 2021. We are also, as many of you might know, um, Bridge Boulevard Redevelopment is under construction in phase one for the South Valley Main Street. Our focus is phase two and phase three, which will begin in March of 2022. We are working with the New Mexico Main Street um, from the state, as well as Bernalillo County Public Works uh, regarding construction mitigation, um, developing frequently you know, FAQs, informing commercial property owners and businesses ahead of time about what the design is gonna look like and what sort of assistance will be there to assist them through the construction phase. Um, this was just from last year, although it was within the fiscal year. Um, we had our fourth annual back to school giveaway that is co-sponsored by Commissioner Stephen Michael Quesada. We were not able to have it at the Dolores Worth the Gateway Park. So what we did instead is we hired delivery drivers with the support of Bernalillo County Commissioner Quesada to distribute over 467 backpacks and 236 food bags containing vegetables from local farmers including Agricultura Network, Bees, Honey, et cetera. And here you can see all of our sponsors and partners for that project. And I'm almost done. So just so for those of you who don't know, we also partner with Bernalillo County and we organize and coordinate the La Familia Growers Market. We just kicked off the La Familia Growers Market last Friday um, and we'll be celebrating our fourth annual back to school giveaway on July 30th, 2021. And then the, I believe that is it. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you for sharing. Commissioner, um, Madam Chair will stand for any questions. Okay, are there any questions or Commissioner Casada, would you like to comment on this since it's your district? Well, yeah, I, I think uh, 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 Bianca has, uh, do you still have something else to, to add? 
Yes, I'm so sorry. I really wanted to take this opportunity to thank um, all of the Bernalillo County Commissioners for your support. I forgot to mention that the county actually created the South Valley Main Street in 2013, and then the nonprofit was created in 2014, where they hired their first executive director in 2016, right? So that partnership is essential for our work, and I'd really like to thank Commissioner Quesada for all of his support, because this work wouldn't be possible without him as well as County Manager Julia morgas Thank you. I see Commissioner Barboa has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you. I just mostly have a comment that I'm so proud to see the work of this. You know, um, our communities need, like right that um, street along bridge is a lifeline for our communities. And to think, I am, I feel um, very moved that it's gonna have some beautiful upgrades. I don't know, I feel so emotional, but like Chavez Karate and um, that childcare, those are like staples that are very recognizable. And so the fact that they've lasted um, is, a, is a award enough, right? And so it's great. And I just like the way y'all are thinking about it. So thanks. Um, Commissioner Quesada and Bianca and the team that are making it happen. Thank you. Yeah, so, it really does look like a wonderful program. So, Madam Chair, um, I would like to make my comment now. Um, sure. You know, um, as, as you cross the bridge into the into the South Valley, as you all know, um, it doesn't present itself right now in a, in the best light. Um, it doesn't really represent the people that are there now. Um, <laughs> And the work that uh, uh, you know, uh, Ms. Encinas has done and, and the work she advocates uh, on a daily basis is really to change that attitude and that, that feeling when you drive over the bridge. Um, and, and you've all heard me really complain about one side of the river to the other. Um, and, and it's a real battle. It's a truthful fight that we continue to do all the time, every day. Um, and, you know, uh, Bridge Boulevard and Isleta Boulevard are the opportunities for the South Valley for economic growth, for, for jobs, and, 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 and it's all small businesses. I know in, in a minute we'll be discussing, you know, tax incentives um, for large corporations, uh, but one of the things that really always turns silent for me when I'm talking to, you know, representatives from state, uh, our state representatives, our state senators, um, people in the community is when I say, you know, I want to treat everybody equal. I think that we shouldn't determine whether you get a tax credit because you're, you're, you're this or you're that or you're, you're this color or you're that color. Um, but why aren't we talking about people who aren't getting tax incentives? Why aren't we talking about small businesses that are in this community who are wanting to comply with what we do as government? Um, when we talk about pay time off or we talk about raising the minimum wage, um, you know, these are prime examples. These businesses and these women owned businesses and these businesses of people of color um, deserve for us to really have those conversations, not get stuck on who's getting tax credits, but let's start talking about who's not getting tax credits. Uh, and, and for the people who are complying with what we mandate as government, um, you know, um, there's, there, it, the system is broken. It is set up for us to fail. Um, we talk about minimum wage all the time, but I'll just tell you this, you know, we raised minimum wage and landlords in my district raised the rent 400 bucks a month. So they never see that minimum wage. They never get to experience how that changes that. There's a small percentage in my district of people who are at that level in the working, in the working environment that we can raise the, the minimum wage to 25 bucks an hour. And because of what happens to them systemically, it never really affects them because they have to pay that money out to a landlord. And I guarantee you that landlord sees them making more money and they want more money. So we need to start having conversations like this. The work that Bianca does on a daily basis really looks at how we look once we get to the other side. But I want to change what really happens to lives when you get on the other side of the river. Um, so I'll end with this. Thank you so much, Bianca. You're so awesome. You're such a champion for that community. They're very lucky to have you. Um, you're one of a kind. 
Um, you're involved in so many different ways that if we had more leaders in the community like you in the South Valley, we would be 10 years advanced than what we, what we could be doing in that area. So I'd like to personally thank you for the time that you take. And I know a lot of your time, I know you, they say you have a job, but I know a lot of the time you volunteer your time to work for that community. And I think you just come from that and that's just who you are. But I think every once in a while, we need to thank you with all our heart for what you do. And now I'm getting an emotional Commissioner Barboa. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Casada. Um, I see Commissioner Benson has his hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Commissioner Kazada, I just wanna second everything you said. And uh, Bianca, thank you so much. Um, and Commissioner Barboa hit the nail on the head. You're helping these businesses stay. And that's what we need. We need businesses to stay, not leave. We need more businesses to come. And, and Commissioner Kasada is right. I think so much focus is pointed as as businesses and business owners as the villains, but we need jobs and people want to work. They want to work and, and we need to provide more jobs. And, and you're right, just raising minimum wage isn't going to do it because I just went to McDonald's and it emptied my wallet because everybody's raising prices because they've got to pay more in the wages themselves. And so um, what, what you're doing is beautiful and our community needs it. And, uh, and those are staples of our, of our city. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you all. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any, thank you again for the wonderful presentation and all of your work, Bianca. Thank, thank you. you. Madam Chair. And you too, Mei Ling. <laughs> um, let's see. Thank you. Approval of minutes is deferred. Um, approval of consent agenda. Madam Clerk, please provide resolution numbers for items 7D and 7G. Yes, ma'am. 7D is AR 2021-63. And 7G is FR 2021-64. Thank you very much. I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Commissioner Casada seconds. All in favor? Wave your hand. Commissioner Benson, you have your hand up. Did you have a question about an item or you were just? Yes, second? Madam Chair, I do. Uh, is this a good time to raise my question? Um, it, it, if it's about an item on the consent agenda, did you want to talk about yes. something? Okay. Yes, I just wanted uh, uh, consent, ag uh, consent agenda item G, Fleet and Facilities Management, with the uh, third floor courtroom. I brought brought to my attention uh, the uh, domestic violence waiting area that the county is working on. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. And uh, as some of you may recall, there was um, an extremely violent episode there uh, several years ago um, because uh, domestic violent uh, receivers and recipients as well as uh, abusers are in the same room. And so we're building a partition. I just wanted to ask uh, uh, County Manager Baca, uh, Morgus Baca, if she could give an update on the waiting room. It's not this this location, but I'd like an update on that. Madam Chair and Commissioner Benson. Um, so yes, thank you for asking about that because I know you have been, this is probably one of the first things you asked about when you came into office. So I'm glad to say that um, the project should be completed within three weeks. Um, and so uh, I know that that was legislative money and a little bit of county money. And so um, thank you for your patience. We really appreciate it. Um, and then just so you know, the total cost for the project was $343,000. And um, I just wanna give a, a compliment to our public works crew, our facility staff, they've done a great job. So thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioner Benson. 
Thank you so much. Okay. So we had a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the consent agenda. And Matt, thank you. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Barboa. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Mr. O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. Okay. And thank you. That passes unanimously. Before we move on, I want to acknowledge um, Diane Layden, who is actually on this call, who um, I sponsored for appointment to the Sheriff's Office Advisory and Review Board. And Diane, did you want to say a few words? Please unmute yourself. I'm honored to be nominated and I'll do my very best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You have a tremendous background and you have such a great resume. I think you're going to do a fantastic job on the SORB as it's called. So thank you so much for stepping up. Thank you. And Commissioner Barboa, <laughs> I would be remiss not to call on you to talk about your appointee. Thank you, Chair. Um, appreciate it for also for knowing me. <laughs> um, yeah, members of the commission, I just I'm proud to um, sponsor Brendan Mason. He's um, a professional um, basketball player himself um, who served over, who's played overseas and coached overseas, um, but also played locally in some of our um, our leagues. But he's also committed his lifetime to um, really youth sports and um, getting young people involved. So I think what a great addition. He's already accomplished a lot. Um, I think he's just going to be such a great asset for our Youth Sports Commission. And just want to thank him for his service. Thank you, Madam Chair. Number Fantastic. Two. Thank you. So moving on. Adoption of Ordinance Amendment to County Code. Um, Madam Clerk, please issue ordinance and resolution numbers for the be below items. Yes, ma'am. 8A1 is Ordinance 2021-12. 8A2 is FR 2021-65. 8B1 is ordinance 2021-13, 8B2 is FR 2021-66, C is ordinance 2021-14. Okay, thank you. I'm just turning the page to make sure we don't have anything else under eight. Okay, so uh, let's see. 8A, Local Economic Development Act, LIDA ordinance related to NM Compounding and Infusion Pharmacy, LLC. Mayling or Marcos, would you like to present? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, members of the commission. The economic development staff recommends the adoption of an ordinance authorizing a local economic development agreement with New Mexico Compounding and Infusion Pharmacy, LLC, as well as approval of a financial resolution appropriating the budget in the amount of 150,000 for the economic development department. I'll stand for any questions. Okay, are there any questions? Commissioner Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Maylene, it's not so much a question. I just wanna highlight that New Mexico compounding and infusion pharmacy is growing. And it's bringing high quality, well-paying physicians with it. And I love that we can help companies like this in our community, bringing jobs. As Commissioner uh, Quesada was saying earlier, we need jobs at all levels and uh, because we've got a, a very diverse workforce and, um, and this is a pharmaceutical company. So it's, it's uh, great and it's uh, thrilling to be part of this with Lita funds. So uh, well done with all your work on this. Thank you. Julianne, is there anybody signed up to speak on this item? Madam Chair, there is not. Thank you. Okay. So if there are no other comments or questions, um, would someone like to make a motion to approve this? I thought you would, Commissioner Benson. 
Um, is there a second? <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Casada. All in favor um, to adopt and approve the financial resolution? Raise your hand. And anyone opposed? <laughs> Okay, um, Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. I'm not sure I saw every hand waving, so let's get a roll call vote. Mr. Barboa. Aye. Commissioner Benson. Aye. Commissioner O'Malley. There she is. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So, so that Thank you, that passes unanimously. Next up, Local Economic Development Act, LIDA ordinance related to American Gypsum LLC. May Ling or Marcos, take it away. Madam Chairwoman, members of the commission, the economic development staff recommends the adoption of an ordinance authorizing a local economic development agreement with American Gypsum Company LLC, as well as an approval of a financial Resolution appropriating the budget in the amount of five hundred thousand for the economic development department. I'll stand for any questions. Any questions? I don't see any hands going up. Um, Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner O'Malley. Thank you. Uh, this is important to note for the public. Lita funds come from the state. Uh, they're basically we're just a almost like a pass through. So we don't make the decision, make that decision about who's getting lead of funds, in other words. So just wanted folks to know. I move approval. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And Julianne, I just want to make sure, is there anybody signed up to speak to this item? Uh, there is not, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, thank you for that clarification and the motion to approve Commissioner O'Malley. Is there a second? Thank you. Oh, I saw Commissioner Benson got in there first. So all in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Madam Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Barboa. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Mr. O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So and fun. that passes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Now moving on to the gross receipts investment policy, the GRIP ordinance related to Pilot Travel Centers, LLC. May Ling or Marcos to present. Madam Chair, members of the commission, the economic development staff recommends the approval of the ordinance approving the gross receipt investment pilot GRIP for Pilot Travel Centers, LLC. I would just like to note for the commission, the original request was a little over a million. Um, and as a result of um, understanding the full infrastructure that was going to be completed, the amount was decreased to 700000 in gross receipts tax reimbursements toward public infrastructure. I'll stand for any questions. Okay, so just to clarify that, because I, I know Ms. Ward had asked that question, so the amount has been reduced and the full amount for the GRIP would be 700,000? Yes, Madam Chair, okay. that is correct. Okay. okay. Are there any questions? Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner Casada. Um, I don't know if you wanna do public comment before I speak or you wanna do it after. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I believe there is somebody waiting for public comment. So why don't we have that person come in and and give their comment. Um, Julianne? Ms. Ward? Julianne, do we just have the one speaker? Yes, that's correct. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Ward. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, the latest living wage for Bernalillo County, according to the MIT calculator, indicates $13.87 for a single adult with no child only eight of the proposed 78 job holders would receive a living wage or salary assuming no dependent. The proposed project appears to be meant for travelers using a busy interstate highway and not dependent on local customers. How is this infill and redevelopment? A commissioner previously referred to a dirt lot. How is this sustainable and smart growth? 
It is fundamentally a gas station with a lot of pumps. Air quality in the surrounding area likely will suffer. If no one lives around there to be harmed, then I go back to the question of how it's infill that would provide jobs and services to nearby workers and residents when the locals would incur regular driving expenses to work or shop at the travel center. Would the commission be giving tax dollars to an out-of-state multi-billion dollar company in direct competition to the tribally owned travel center just down the road? I submit that the incentive demand was not made for need of money, but rather is intended to test the commission's values and resolve. I respectfully request that Commissioner Quesada withdraw the ordinance in support of directing these funds to the causes listed earlier. Absent that, I request that each commissioner vote against this ordinance. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Ward. Commissioner Quesada. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I do move for approval uh, and my comments are that um, you know we don't we don't we shouldn't uh, discriminate about who and what and who receives um, tax incentives through Bernalillo County. Um, I think we should figure out a way how we can do all of them. We just passed a lead up a lead of fund, but it has to be X amount of jobs. It has to be X amount of this. There's so many regulations for local businesses to be successful. So um, this is important to this district to change the direction of the, of the kind of industry that comes into the area. Competition has always been the American way. We cannot back up one to, to try to help another. Um, that's even in our own rules. Um, and look, it's very hard for me to try to get other kind of businesses uh, to go next to an asphalt plant or an auto salvage yard. Um, as you know, not many great types of industry and businesses want to move to that type of area. The only way we're going to change this is if we embrace change in a systemic way. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's jobs there. It's not just a gas station, as you know, there will be a McDonald's. Those jobs are important. Those jobs are important to my children, and they're going to be important to many children in the district. Um, delivery trucks will be delivering items there. Um, I just met with one of the guys who does. He's a local guy who provides uh, putting in non-perishable items in all the gas stations. He says this will up his game. He will be able to hire two more people uh, as we keep building this type of uh, jobs, right? Everybody needs gas. Everybody needs a convenience store. Um, they're successful businesses because they're successful businesses because the community needs them. Um, I, and I truly believe that I'm looking at the long game here and trying to bring different jobs uh, around what we bring in. Um, if you look at what has been presented to us uh, in the South Valley, it's asphalt plants. It's other types of polluting industry that I cannot support. This shows the direction of what I want to do and where I'd like to go for the community and how we can change what happens in the area. It's important that we look again at the long game. And with that, I urge your support of uh, this particular ordinance. Thank Chairwoman you. Piscotti, this is Ross with Pilot Travel Centers and I'd like to speak if that's okay. Um, okay, go ahead, Mr. Shaver. Yeah, so um, I was trying to jot down Mrs. Ward's comments, but what I'd like to do, if it's okay, is I've got just a very quick presentation that I'd like to do just to help clarify the group request and those, those tax dollars associated. And I think that will help Mrs. Ward understand uh, the ask as, as well as the solution, if, if that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, go ahead, clarify sure. so what the if ask If I can is. share my screen. Julianne, can you make that happen? Thank you. Yeah, so can you uh, see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll try to keep this brief because I know there's there's other agenda items. So the problem is is the lack of the utility and road infrastructure. Uh, I think we've talked about this last time, but that's a three plus million dollar issue. So part of the the reason this area has struggled to develop is the lack of infrastructure. You can see that the water is two miles away down Broadway Boulevard and sewer is almost three miles away. So when we worked with the, the appropriate Albuquerque, Bernalillo County utility, 
that's a 10 plus million dollar price tag to bring necessary utilities essentially down Broadway Boulevard, which is one of the main items that is restricting this area from development. So um, we also encumbered the issues of uh, Broadway Boulevard not being up to DOT standards, which is another reason we're have to, having to mitigate these roads. Uh, you can see from my, my hand cursor here, this left turn pocket into this property, along with a left turn pocket onto the frontage road, which is actually what will service New Mexico terminal services, is not set appropriately and severely deficient which is part of the reason this project, the pilot project, will develop this frontage, this intersection um, to DOT standards and will not only benefit the pilot project, it will also benefit other county projects um, such as New Mexico Terminal, so, excuse me, New Mexico Terminal Services and this frontage road. So just to show you what we have to do to overcome these issues, so, um, we have to construct on-site utilities, which consist of a septic system and a water system. That septic system consists of multiple septic tanks, a water, excuse me, a wastewater treatment plant that actually is state of the art. It comes from Israel uh, in order to meet all the requirements. That has a price, and excuse me, over an acre of leach field of this property uh, gets consumed by just being able to treat the waste. And that has a price tag of about $900,000. We're also going to have to drill a well and install a 360,000-gallon raw water tank, a fire pump, and fire system to, to take care of the fire suppression system required by the, the fire department. That has a price tag of $1.4 million. So both of those items are $2.3 million that we're not asking the county to assist on whatsoever. We're, we're eating that. We're going to burden ourselves with that um, in order to be a part of the community here. The item that we are requesting help on is the mitigation of the road. So uh, you heard me mention the left turn pocket being deficient on Broadway. So where my cursor is right now is about the location of where that turn pocket ends today. And it has to be extended all the way down here to meet current DOT standards. This shows how deficient this frontage road is today that we have to bring up the DOT standards. We're also going to install a traffic signal, which will benefit uh, New Mexico Terminal Services, uh, as well as make the entire corridor safer because the DOT has established a Broadway uh, Boulevard corridor, and this project will help kick that off. Uh, and that's about $800,000. We're only asking for 700,000 of it, and we're gonna burden the other 100,000. So the solution in the current request is, as May Ling uh, mentioned, the initial grip request is 1.46 million. We've been able to reduce that grip request to 700,000 as we went back and um, restructured our deal with the property owner. Because again, this property has sat here um, vacant, really unusable for an extensive period of time because of the lack of infrastructure. So they were able to bring more money to the table and reduce our need in order to make our economic criteria work. Um, and to be quite frank with you, our economic criteria for this piece of property is still below our company standards. So this is why we need the incentive in order to make the economics work, um, or we may not be able to move forward with this project. So just so we all understand the GRT uh, dollars associated with this project, here is a bar chart. The left uh, orange bar is pilots projected GRT created over 30 years of being $2.9 million. The middle bar in blue is $2.2 million that the county will retain in full. To the right is the green bar of $700,000 that the county would reimburse pilot over a period of time based upon our GRT generated. So, um, I think it's important for Mrs. Ward and the public to understand that gross receipts tax, this piece of property, the development, only receives tax based on the gross receipts generated by the business. So therefore, what we're going to be producing, we're essentially creating $2 to receive a dollar back until it's reimbursed um, in its simplest form. So one of the things that we didn't talk about at last uh, at the last hearing was the property tax value associated. So here's another bar chart on the right hand side. 
you see uh, a, a small green bar of $583,000. So if you look at the property tax value that this piece of property is generating today, and you equate that over a 30 year period and using the county's historical increases, that, that property value is $583,000 of property tax over 30 years. If Pilot were to develop with all of its assets, turn this into commercial property, Pilot would produce $8.8 .8 million of property tax revenue over 30 years. So if you think about a payback period of just property tax for the $700,000 of the GRT, that's three to four years. So um, if you think about a rolling cash sum of the GRT and property tax combined, then this grip would be reimbursed back to the county within two to three years. I mean, that's an extremely quick payback period based upon the property tax and the GRT uh, generated by the pilot project. So um, here's an employee breakdown. After the, the last hearing and given our country's labor issues, we did go back and look at this. We were able to increase um, what we believe the jobs would be created of 78 with a total annual payroll of $1.54 million. Now I will tell you, this does not include bonuses, which some of these positions will receive bonuses. I know county staff estimated and it's in their, in their report, uh, a job creation of 102 direct and indirect jobs along with 91 construction jobs. So when we're talking about jobs, we're not talking about just the pilot. We're talking about all the indirect jobs and all the construction jobs associated which many of our contractors will be local and state contractors uh, within that area. So I, I know we sent out a lot of benefit information, um, but I just wanted to highlight a few. Uh, we do offer benefits to both full-time and part-time. This includes mental and retirement. Um, Chairman Piscotti, I know mental health was a big important item to you based on our last hearing. Uh, I can tell you this includes mental health. It also includes unlimited counseling over the phone at no cost to our employees. And I think uh, something that that pilot really shows and not only cares about employees, but it cares about the employees' families is through tuition assistance and adoption assistance. And that's up to $8,000 per adoption, which I find incredible. Um, there's also a training program to raise up the employees and something else that, that is unique pilot that I'm proud of is the Women's Network. Um, and that has a motto of providing pilots women with the skill sets, confidence, and network necessary for personal and professional growth. Um, so in closing, uh, our ask is a $700,000. Again, this is just uh, generated by the gross receipts tax that the pilot project generates as half of that tax. Um, the county is not burdened with any expense and the county will continue to make money throughout this entire time. So with that being said, I'll stand for any questions. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Shaver. And Madam I know Chair, that, I'm sorry. Okay, I know Commissioner Benson has had his hand up. Can you wait, Commissioner Casada? Well, I just want to end it with this and then I'll turn it over to, you know, Commissioner uh, Benson is that, you know, tax incentives are for where there is nothing there, where it's a blank piece of, property in my opinion and because I have so much of it I believe that's where that should be focused on um, I have other projects that are be coming up here on 118th street as you know we have projects in some port south that uh, are also going to be looking for uh, incentives because they're just empty lots right now um, uh, we've given tax incentives to places right in the middle of the city of Albuquerque where I don't believe they should they needed that um, you know, uh, because they've got prime property. It's for where there is no development, where there is need for the community is the reason I believe tax incentives are in place. So, you know, I just wanted to make sure I made that statement because it's really important, uh, you know, how we agree to giving tax incentives. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, I just want to thank Ms. Ward for coming to the meeting and uh, voicing her concern. Uh, I appreciate hearing it, and I did vote in favor of it uh, when this came up, and I'm still in favor, but I do appreciate hearing from you. And um, just to give my perspective, I don't take a tax incentive lightly. 
Um, and I had constituents of my own reaching out to me, questioning that. I don't take this lightly. Uh, I went to the Albuquerque Economic Development Forum today. They are struggling mightily, doing everything they can to help Bernalillo County, the city of Albuquerque, bring in jobs. New Mexico has the second worst unemployment rate in the nation right now. They hired outside consultants from out, outside of New Mexico did, who did tons of research. And New Mexico and Albuquerque are rated as two of the least business-friendly environments in the Southwest. And we've got to change that. We, we need jobs. And, and, and actually, as Ross said, I'm glad he said it because I was going to point it out. This went into my decision is that yes, there's a gross receipts tax incentive. However, they are investing $3 million. They are also gonna be paying property taxes in a much higher rate than is being paid now. There hasn't been an offer. They, they, they offered this four years ago. We said no, because we didn't wanna give away money. It sat vacant and we're not giving away money. We're not making gross receipts tax money on that property now. It's zero now. And so now this is the potential to earn gross receipts tax in the future. The other thing is these jobs, they're good jobs. They may not be a six figure jobs, but that doesn't mean they're not worthwhile and they're not honorable. And if somebody wants to work when we have the second highest unemployment rate in the nation, I think we should encourage that. And so when they earn paychecks, they're gonna spend it in the community. Then there goes gross receipts tax. That goes up a little bit. So this was all in my thought process when I, I thought this was a, a good move. And Pilot is a good community member. They take care of their employees. Um, and they're investing into this project. Uh, and it's money that we don't have to invest. And businesses and neighbors in that area will benefit from this, this investment of $3 million into the infrastructure. So. Um, those are my thoughts, and that's why I voted in favor of this. Uh, it's not to just give away money. It's to, it's to create economic development, and that's it. But, um, but again, I, I do thank Ms. Ward. I, I appreciate where you're coming from, and um, we have a difference of opinion, but, uh, but I do respect your position, so thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Benson. Yes, Commissioner O'Malley. I... Am I in line to speak or is anybody speaking? Yes, you well? are. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I, I just wanted to touch base a little bit on the GRT incentive. And um, I think that's a really nice incentive for businesses. If it, uh, fortu fortunately for us, not every business takes advantage of that because we wouldn't have much of a GRT if we, if we did that. And this argument I think about that, well, we were not generating any money out of it. We could say that for every new business, right? Um, they're, they're creating GRT and, you know, so I, I just, I have a problem with that particular ar argument. I thought it was interesting that, and I don't wanna get into a conversation with the representative of Pilot, but that uh, he said, well, we're not gonna move forward without these two incentives. They still have to pay the same amount of money, 1.4. And then there was, a, of course, a, uh, that other fee, uh, and which was like $48,000 or something like that. So I thought that's interesting that now, I guess they can't move forward for half that amount now. So I just think that's pretty strange. Uh, I think we do have to be very discriminating when we look at these particular proposals. That's our job. Uh, look at the re rate of return, what does it benefit to the community, jobs, all those things. We have to, we have to discriminate. We have to go through that process. Uh, it's uh, not just a apply here and here you go. It's not that kind of a thing. We're basically saying on behalf of the public that we're going to make an investment. We're going to make that decision on behalf of our uh, constituents. So um, I basically feel the same way I did before. I, I really, it's a gas station. Uh, I found a location, it's a beneficial location, otherwise they wouldn't be investing there. 
It's not some sort of recruitment effort, I don't believe. Uh, and um, they pick the spot, they, they make those decisions financially. I don't blame them, uh, any company from going forward and asking for a subsidy. They do it a lot, they do it all the time. That's where we come in and say, well, does this, does this meet our standards or does it meet what we think uh, our standards should be for the county? So with that, I'm not gonna support it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for actually Elias from Public Works about just what this this seven hundred thousand dollars would cover. What's can you talk a little bit about that public infrastructure? Uh, so, based on what the type of development, that, oh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, so based on the type of infrastructure uh, or that is being uh, proposed on these developed lots, um, the local government governing agency, in this case, it was the New Mexico DOT, who is the uh, owner of the road, will determine <clears throat> what the change in land use does to the needs of the road. So in this case, uh, we have a truck stop going in uh, and so this is very similar to what you referred to on the, on the other side of the road with the New Mexico terminal services coming in. Both are heavy truck uh, generating uh, uses. So when the DOT reviewed the, the road conditions and what would be needed to support both of these developments, <clears throat> they, they require the installation of the turn base uh, which are the left turns, both which cover both left turns into both the pilot center on the east side of the roadway, as well as uh, the Mexico terminal services on the west side of the roadway. Uh, in addition, because these are semi trucks and they take a while to get up to speed when they're entering a roadway, uh, they also require that these uh, that both of these uh, developments uh, put in acceleration lanes. And what the, the reason for both the turn lanes and the accelerations is, is it's a safety measure to ensure that, or to reduce the likelihood of differential speed conditions. And what that is, is if you have a, a, a vehicle that's traveling the posted speed, in this case, 45 miles an hour on Broadway, and you have a semi truck that's pulling into and entering that roadway. And as he turns in and enters, that truck is traveling at best 15 to 20 miles an hour, you wanna be able to separate those into different lanes. So you provide the acceleration lane for that truck to get closer to that traveling speed. You may not get all the way up to 45 miles an hour, but he's closer to that speed. He's 35 or 40 miles an hour. So the risk of a vehicle not, you know, not paying attention, we have a distracted driving problem. Uh, comes up on a slow moving vehicle and you end up in a rear end collision. So, the, those were the basis of what was required. Now, <clears throat> Pilot was also um, the development that came in that added enough vehicles uh, turning, entering, uh, or added enough vehicles to that intersection that triggered the requirement for the traffic signal. And so that, that usually hits, and that's kind of a disproportionately uh, applied requirement because the first one or two developments that come in may not generate enough traffic to require that signal, but the next guy who comes in gets hit with that requirement. So in this case, pilot put him just over the threshold to require a traffic signal. So that is the, that's the reason they're requiring that signal. Uh, and then lastly, um, the other requirement that was put on both of these uh, developers was that because these are heavy trucks and semis that are using this this intersection, the DOT required that they construct this uh, it, these improvements out of concrete versus asphalt. And the reason is is that provides uh, you know almost double uh, double the life for that pavement uh, in there. So instead of getting a 20 year life on that pavement, they get almost a 40 year life out of the car. Can I stand okay. for any more questions? Okay. 
So it sounds like, you know, I'm, I'm guessing, well, like I said last time, um, pilot is, they're smart. They know that that area is, is a good, a profitable area and that it's ready to pop um, in terms of business. So that public infrastructure would, what I hear you saying, Elias, is it would have to go in sooner or later that that would have to be put in. So um, it's a, a necessary uh, improvement to the public, um, whatever, thoroughfare. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, okay, I'm just trying to understand if that improvement is necessary and if it is, it will be used by more than just pilot and if it can be used further on to uh, further economic development in that area. Madam Chair. Yeah. Oh, um, Madam Chair, right, to answer your question, yes, it will. Uh, these improvements will benefit that road and that stretch of Broadway uh, for pretty much all the users in there because, again, it, it makes, it takes those turning movements out of the main roadway, which reduces the congestion for all the other users that are using uh, Broadway up and down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner Casada, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add something that that kind of infrastructure and that kind of stuff isn't something that we normally get uh, in my district. Um, up here where I live on 98th, you know, they had developers develop all these housing um, developments and each one of them says, well, we're not quite at the threshold for you to get traffic lights and, and stoplights. And we still, after they developed the whole area, they left us here with all four way stops. We still don't have that, that proper infrastructure where we're now trying to figure out how we can afford on the county's dime, all of it, 100% on the county or the city's dime, how to put in, you know, stoplights up in this area. Um, this is probably the first time I've ever heard that we're making them do that right at the beginning, because usually they wait till the threshold is way past. And still, we still have just nothing but four-way stops, unlike on the other side, on the north side of the Mesa, uh, before they even got to the threshold of the housing for traffic lights, they already have the traffic lights, Madam Chair, and we don't have them on our side. So we've been fighting the, the true fight and the blightness uh, of, of, of developing these blighted areas historically for hundreds of years. And for them to be able to put that type of infrastructure right away from the get-go is another reason why I'm supporting, you know, this particular project and, 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 and especially, you know, the infrastructure that's going in for the future of how that area develops. Because without that infrastructure, it is not going to develop the way we want it. It is going to be asphalt plants, brick factories, and auto salvage yards. And we don't have a say-so on that, Madam Chair. Um, they just, it's zoned that way. They go in, they do it, and we don't even get a say-so. And the only way I'm going to be able to change this is to change the, not only access, but the infrastructure that comes in. I'm taking this as an opportunity for the future. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Commissioner Barboa. Um, yeah, I went to um, <clears throat> I, um, double, really double check for myself. I think it's a question for Enrico Grady, um, but also I heard um, Miss Ward mention right about the nearby. I, I I believe I asked this last time about the the about the nearby tribe and any impact it has, and I believe you told me that they um, that the county does do a like announcement that these things are going down and people have a opportunity response. So the tribe would have been heard about this, right? Um, Chairman Piscotti, uh, Commissioner Barboa, that is correct. Um, and as these things get closer to fruition, we're always in communication uh, with the tribal offices as well. Okay, that was all that I had. And I wanted to double check for myself and for Ms. Ward also. Okay. Um, so Commissioner Casada made a motion. Is there a second? Commissioner Benson seconds. All in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Okay, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. 
Commissioner Barboa. Aye. Commissioner Benson. Aye. Commissioner O'Malley. No. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So called. That passes four to one. Thank you. Thank you, Commission. And we look forward to Pilot doing some good things for the community, Mr. Shaver. Well, we look forward to being a part of the community and we'll hopefully be under construction here in the next 30 days as our intent. Okay. Um, thank you. So moving on to, oh, adoption of resolution. Madam Clerk, you're on again. Please issue ordinance and resolution numbers for the following items under number nine. Number 9A is AR 2021-67. 9B is AR 2021-68. 9C is FR 2021-69. Thank you very much, Madam County Clerk Linda Stover. And so the first one, honoring the life and service of Father Graham R. Golden. Um, Vice Chair Casada, would you like to speak to this item, please? Yes, um, in, uh, you know, fa Father, Father Graham R. Golden was uh, at the church that I grew up in. Um, he is a big, huge loss to this community. Uh, there's a giant hole in our hearts um, from that tragic loss on Coors Boulevard. And um, it doesn't um, it doesn't help us really with the, the problems we're having on that street. As you all know, it is a state road. It's not our road. Um, we've been trying to advocate for changes on that road for many, many, many years. Um, and so, I, and I believe that this is something that not only is going to honor, um, you know, uh, Father. Uh, Father Graham and, uh, and 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 Mr. Golden, I, um, uh, he was very close to the community. Um, he he means so much to us, and so me and uh, Councillor Pena on the city side, you know, we're 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 putting we're moving this forward, and we're hoping that we can get the same support uh, from uh, the state, and. Um, and it's in a resolution. And so I guess the best way for me, for you guys to get to know him is for me to read this resolution. So a resolution uh, for the county of Bernalillo County to join with the city to dedicate a section of Coors Boulevard to honor the life and service of Father Graham R. Golden, um, a, a, a pream, and to urge the New Mexico legislature and the New Mexico Department of Transportation to make the same dedication. Whereas Father Graham R. Golden O. Uh, Param lived his life as a testimony of God's all-embracing love, mercy, and grace, and whereas Father Graham was born to Dan and Deborah Golden on January 8th, 1986 in Albuquerque, and died in an automobile accident on May 21st, 2021, at the age of 35, Whereas Father Graham had been a part of the Norbertine community of Santa Fe Maria uh, de la Vida Abbey in Albuquerque, New Mexico for 12 years. Uh, and he would have celebrated his sixth year as an ordained priest on June 20th, 2021. And whereas throughout his years of communal life and service, Father Graham was, was well known for being present whenever and wherever he was needed or invited. And whereas Father Graham entered the Norbertine community with a deep desire to serve the poor, the oppressed, and mostly marginalized members of our community, and whereas many members of our Albuquerque community have a personal story of an encounter with Father Graham that has touched and impacted or greatly changed their lives. And whereas Father Graham engaged in extensive work in the Albuquerque community, including but not limited to work with teenagers and young adults preparing, uh, uh, facilitating uh, uh, home, homies, uh, 
homilies and supporting the expansion of the retreat center at the Abbey, committing himself to the pilgrimages of vocation and establishing a group of young Norbertines. And whereas Father Graham served on several boards and committees for the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, worked for the Catholic Foundation for a time and served as the previous pastor of Our Lady of Most Holy Rosary Catholic Community, most recently recent pastor St. Augustine Church in Isleta Pueblo, and the vocation director and director of the Office of Christian uh, Disciplineship and Religious Vocation at the Abbey, among other roles. And whereas Father Graham, untimely death, shall serve as a catalyst for encouraging more public investment among the New Mexico Department of Transportation, the City of Albuquerque, Bernalillo County, Mid-Region Council of Governments, the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority, and the New Mexico State Legislature to improve safety along Coors Boulevard from Central Avenue to south of Bernalillo County limits. And whereas in January 2021, Bernalillo County adopted AR 2021-14 to establish Coors Boulevard and State Highway 45 as a priority area for making improvements to the corridor to align with urban arterial standards. And whereas through a continued collaboration amongst the city, county, uh, uh, Bernalillo County will for its part consider a dedication and directives uh, substantially like those expressed here. And whereas Father Graham was an extraordinary, dedicated, talented, and intelligent young priest in Albuquerque, and his pastoral heart touched many individuals and groups during the short six years of his priesthood. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners, the governing body of the County of Bernalillo, that the county will dedicate a section of Coors Boulevard to honor his life and service of Father Graham. And the county will urge the New Mexico Department of Transportation, New Mexico State Legislature, to make the same dedication. Should the New Mexico Department of Transportation make the same dedication, the county will install, within one year of the dedication, appropriate signs or plaques, and the county will inspect the signs annually and perform all maintenance, repairs, replacement of the signs or plaques at no cost of the Department of Transportation. The county will prioritize transportation and infrastructure investment amid an improving public safety along Coors Boulevard from Central Avenue south to Borough County limits. The county will urge the New Mexico State Legislature to provide ongoing capital outlay funding to provide transportation infrastructure investments along Coors Boulevard from Central Avenue to South Bernalillo County limits. Upon enactment of substantially similar resolution by the city, the dedication and the directives expressed by the county and the city will, will constitute a joint resolution of the two governments only as to the matters expressed by each respectively done, hopefully this day of 2021. Thank you very much. Um, are there any comments or questions? Okay. Um, Commissioner Casad, oh, go ahead, Commissioner Barboa. I just wanted to say thank you, um, uh, you know, Father Graham, was um, beloved by many in my family that live right there off of 59th and Fortuna. Holy Rosary is the church I grew up going to in my grandma's house. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just thankful for this. I know the community was really touched and I hope this is a time that community can use this to really organize for those changes you say needed are needed on this road. And um, hopefully um, Father Graham's um, death isn't in vain, right? So thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you. Commissioner Casado, would you like to make a motion? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in honor of Father Graham, I move for approval. Okay. Okay, I thought you might want to second that, Commissioner Barboa. So all in favor, raise your hand. Okay. And Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Barboa. Aye. Commissioner Benson. Aye. 
Commissioner O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. And that passes unanimously. So thank you for bringing this to us, Commissioner Vice Chair Casada. Um, and it looks like you are sponsoring the next item as well, the employee banking. So um, I, I'd like you to say a little bit about this. And I know that Treasurer Nancy Burse has reached out to me. She wanted to ask some questions and give a little history. So Commissioner Casada, would you like to just present a little on this item, please? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would I would like to dive in a lot deeper into this right now, uh, but um, uh, first of all, I want to thank Hannah Bell. Uh, she's amazing. Um, she's trying to navigate something that I thought was simple and turns out not to be um, so simple. And I'd like to thank her for her patience. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow uh, uh, Madam uh, or Madam. Uh, uh, treasurer to speak. And then after that, I'm going to ask uh, Madam Chair for a deferral of nine of 30 days. So after you, and, and I think it'll make more sense once uh, Madam Treasurer speaks. Mm -hmm. So Madam Treasurer, if you, if you would please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Go ahead, Madam Treasurer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Commissioner uh, and Madam Chair. Um, so let me just understand that um, I have more than 90 seconds as a personal yeah. point of privilege. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I was trying to speed read through my notes and 90 seconds just wasn't, uh, wasn't happening here. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to speak as uh, your county treasurer and your official county banker on this topic. Um, when I was elected in 2016 by county residents, my campaign platform did include financial literacy. In 2017, when I took office, I partnered with our custodial bank to provide financial literacy classes to treasury staff. Who better than treasury staff to really be able to walk the talk, right? Uh, so we brought that in. I provided the time, the conference room for any employee to attend. And it was about eight one hour long seminars. Um, many compliments received by my staff on that. They learned a lot and they continued to grow in their financial literacy. In 2018, I learned uh, that Rio Grande Credit Union uh, was elected over 20 years ago um, to be the designated credit union for the city of Albuquerque and Bernalillo County employees. Uh, I then encouraged Rio Grande Credit Union to sponsor uh, what was and had been always a credit union ATM machine here in Civic Plaza. It had been removed from the previous Mayor Barry. Um, Rio Grande was successful in doing that and uh, I celebrated with them and hosted a ribbon cutting of the new installed CU ATM that's on the first floor. And again, we celebrated with the city treasurer, Councillor Borrego, uh, who sits on the Rio Grande Credit Union Board. Uh, there was a ribbon cutting. Uh, there was a, a table provided with brochures and Rio Grande Credit Union staff to learn about this important um, institution, if you will. Then again, in 2019 and 2020, um, we were seeing new staff come on board, a little bit of turnover, and I contacted Rio Grande to sponsor financial literacy classes again for my office, but this time said, you know, why don't we you go to uh, the, the county and have this presented during our uh, employee orientation. Uh, I had learned from other county employees that that had historically happened. Uh, so I said, let's do it. Uh, and then I heard nothing until 
seeing this agenda item on the packet. I will say in my experience, 25 years plus, as an employee benefits manager and consultant, credit unions <clears throat> were always considered fringe benefits for the employee due to their employment. The same is true at the county, I believe. Providing information on Rio Grande Credit Union is a benefit to the employee, to the family, to join a member organization that is owned and operated for the membership. As your county banker, my understanding of procurement of financial institutions was um, intended to be for financial institutions handling county funds. And of course, those county funds fall under my obligation as your treasurer. And detailing um, also in our procurement rules, uh, we wanted, my understanding was, we wanted to uh, give more of our flavor of financial institutions uh, that, that are at the basis of state statute in public finance and banking sections, cit citation 61010. This section was never thought of for credit union information, services, and sponsorship of employee programs, including financial literacy. Historically, the county did include Rio Grande Credit Union in new hire packets at orientation, as well as providing exhibit tables and staff to meet and greet with city and county employees, not only here at Civic Plaza, but also throughout other county buildings. I disagree with going out to bid. The Rio Grande Credit Union already stands as the member banking organization. That has not changed. Having worked uh, back in New Mexico since 1999, um, I've worked with many public employers, Albuquerque Public Schools, the state of New Mexico, um, even consulted at Kirtland Air Force Base, and credit unions were never RFP'd by the employer, but chosen by the employees. And that is an important distinction. My suggestion is we, we take some time and look at these procurement rules. After all, they are our rules. They can be changed. We can grandfather or exempt Rio Grande Credit Union. Uh, and given this history and this understanding, um, that Rio Grande is, hand, is not handling county funds as would be under the procurement rules for financial institutions. It does not need to qualify, but it exists already as a member organization, as a fringe benefit for city and county employees. Thank you, and I stand for any questions and, and discussion. I appreciate the time. And thank you, Treasurer Burst, for bringing up um, some of the history and some of the questions. And um, I'm, I appreciate you offering to defer this item, Commissioner Casada, because there are procurement and legal issues involved. And so we want to make sure that we um, do everything right. So I appreciate you bringing Absolutely. all of those issues up and, and, and giving us the history, too. I appreciate that. Any questions or comments on this item? I just so, want to publicly that I'm not a member of the Real Ground Credit Union. Um, I do not bank with the Real Ground Credit Union, so I'm not trying to do something or have any relationship with the Real Ground Credit Union. Um, uh, but but my uh, my assistant went, oh, I can join the Real Ground Credit Union now. Um, was something that I heard today because uh, she's always wanted to join that. I go, of course you can. You're a you're an employee of Bernal Hill County, and so she's going to run out and join the Real Ground Credit Union. But I'm not a member. Um, you know, I, I I have a bank that I've had for so many years that it would just be a big hassle to change every. I think a lot of people feel that way. It would be a big hassle to change things over now that I could even be a member. 
But I'm not trying to advocate for any particular bank. That wasn't the purpose. Me and Hannah had many conversations. I was trying to get to a point where all, and this is really what I want. I want, I want the bank that, that offers services to government, county, and city workers, uh, and to be able to go into orientation and be able to present 10 minutes about what they offer uh, and, and they could join it or they, they don't have to join it. So we're not really picking a bank over a bank. We're just, we're just bringing in a bank who does provide services for those employees. And so me uh, and Madam Treasurer, we had a long conversation and we talked about how we could do this properly and have it to where we're supporting, you know, uh, banks that do specific memberships. And so I want the 30 days so we can uh, have her input and her knowledge uh, and, and work with me and Hannah uh, so we can do this right and where it, it runs, it flows, and it's and, and we don't give uh, Miss Sadio White any more heartburn uh, and that we're all on the same page and that we're doing the right thing. Uh, but I think it's something that's important. Uh, I know the Water Utility Authority already does it and they, they have the exact same procurement we do. So we wanna ask those questions, okay? Uh, other than that, thank you. And I'm, I'm asking for a deferral. Okay, thanks. I see Commissioner Benson has his hand up, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to um, kind of reiterate uh, what Madam Treasurer spoke of. I have the honor of working with her on the investment committee, and that's because of credit unions. Um, I worked for 13 years for U.S. Eagle Federal Credit Union in their finance department and then commercial lending under uh, Jim Roquette and Miss Marsha Majors, who's now their amazing CEO. Uh, so I'm not specifically advocating for Rio Grande Credit Union. But uh, I am familiar with them. I've had auto loans with them. Uh, they're a great organization. But I can say that credit unions uh, are focused. They're a not-for-profit, first of all. Uh, they're federally regulated. And they, uh, they focus on member education, <clears throat> which financial education, I think, is, is way more important than uh, any other piece of finance. Uh, to, to raise people out of poverty, uh, it's, not, it's not throwing money at them. Uh, you can see millionaires file bankruptcy because it's financial education that lifts people out of poverty. And so uh, I would just like to second any consideration of the credit union, um, whatever it is, I, I would second it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I would also like to second that Lisa Cedillo White and Hannah Bell are awesome people who do an, just a, a terrific job. So I, <laughs> you guys do great work and I trust you. So um, all in favor of deferring this item, raise your hand. It looks like Commissioner Barboa wants to vote on it. Oh no, she raised her hand. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Barboa. Commissioner Benson. Aye. Commissioner O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So called. So that will be put on a later agenda. Madam Chair, Move. if I can just get yes. clarification for the record on who seconded the deferral, please. I think I did. Perfect. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay. So moving on public safety training facility. Dina Escoval, you have a big job here. Please present. Good evening, Madam Chair Commissioners. The item before you is the award of RFP number 1021 AB for a Public State Safety Training Academy design, construction, lease, and maintain of, a pub, of the Bernalillo County. Approval of a financial resolution appropriating the fund balance of amount of $1,490 thousand dollars for purposes of the allowance for the design of green globe expenditures approval of a 30-year true lease with fire ed in the amount of 51,794,311.92 for the lease and the authorization for the county manager to execute any contract amendments or other agreements on behalf of the commission that is related to this project. Um, 
To begin with, the procurement process consisted of a two-phased approach. It began with the request for qualifications. It was issued in April of 2020 and resulted in three submittals. From that, we went on to um, the evaluation committee who, who opted to um, proceed with two of the highest ranked firms. And that, that RFP process was issued in November of 2020 with a closing date of March, 2021. The two finals, the finalists that were um, advanced were Thunderbird Kirtland Development, TKD, and Fire Ed LLC. During November 2020 to February 2021, we did hold three confidential meetings, which was also included in the solicitation documents. And the, the three confidential meetings was with each of the two finalists. In addition to that, I'd like to mention that during this process, the team that worked on this solicitation um, actually um, a, had 45 meetings that we actually talked and um, discussed the financials and best and final offers, et cetera. The selection advisory team um, selected the firm of FireEd LLC. FireEd is led by the development team of Jerry Mosher and Jan Wilson, who are equal partners. The general contractor is Bradbury Stam, and other members of um, the team also include local engineering and architectural firms. The facility itself will be a 40,981 square foot training academy. The um, construction will take a 20 month period. And it is anticipated that the notice to proceed will happen in July 2021 if it is passed. And the completion is estimated to be in March of 2023. The design will include um, energy efficiencies and sustainability. The negotiated lease agreement for the 30-year term um, includes a base rent of 1,391,459.12 annually. And it also has um, includes the cost and expenses uh, for um, maintenance and repair. The county uh, will be responsible for, re for reimbursing the contractor for property taxes in the true amount. And in addition, we will be responsible for janitorial and utility costs. The staff is requesting the board's approval for the award of this contract and um, in accordance with AR 2018-49, we must present to the board um, this agreement because it does exceed the county manager's signature authority of or $150,000 for leases. I stand for any questions. Um, I see County Manager Julie has her hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Benson, did you want to say, did you want to ask something? I just wanted to add a few things, and but I'm willing to, to wait. No, uh, Madam County, County Manager, go ahead. I've taken up quite a bit of your time so far regarding this. So go ahead and I'll, I'll follow you. Okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner Benson. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, is, um, first of all, I just wanted to thank all of you for taking your valuable time with us to meet um, individually to talk about this. And we had some really good discussions. And again, I just appreciate the questions um, because I think that they were very helpful as we move forward. Um, as we told you, this Public Safety Academy, it's way overdue. Um, the consolidation effort was overdue because the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Sheriff's Office, um, they've been, the Academy has been in the old courthouse since like 2009, <clears throat> excuse me, nine. And also the Fire Academy has been in a substandard building 
um, in, on South Broadway since 2007. Um, they have done their best to work under some, you know, some tough conditions. Um, neither of the, the current training academies um, were intended to be permanent locations. So I just wanted you all to know that. Um, the decision to, to use the bill to suit option, it was carefully vetted um, for two years. And I want you all to feel, and our public, to feel confident that you know, this wasn't taken lightly, that we have our, you know, our best and brightest county staff, including you know, our county attorney, Ken Martinez, um, involved our DCMs, um, and of course, Dinah, who just spoke, uh, Lisa Manuel, who's the director of facilities. Um, everybody just, we all um, met, we talked about it, we had lots of discussions, did a lot of research for a couple of years. So like I say, it wasn't taken lightly. And um, we also involved Jill Sweeney, our bond counsel. Um, we, we hired a consultant out of California, um, a bill to, to suit um, consultant that was able to assist us as well as Kathy Davis. And she's a, a very well-respected attorney, real estate attorney here in Albuquerque. So although we use the design build model for Alvarado Square, um, the build to suit method um, we're recommending for this project is it's, it's, it's a financing mechanism uh, for public private partnership, partnerships in which the developer is responsible, as Dinah said, for building, owning, and maintaining the facility and leasing it back to the county for 30 years. Um, this uh, built to suit uh, lease option does not increase taxes. Um, we, we want to be good stewards of um, our pub with our public um, money, our taxpayers money. We want to live within our means since the lease option is coming out of the general fund um, operating budget. So I wanted to, to kind of emphasize that it comes out of our operating budget. Um, some of the lease costs are offset by the current leases lease payments or offset by the facilities that we're selling or are being vacated. Okay, so that's at the atrium and also 415 Tijeras. Okay, I'm sorry, not the atrium. There's a facility, I'm sorry, uh, that the fire department is using um, in the South Valley on South uh, Broadway. And so, you know, we are not in increasing our debt service payments since we are not financing um, with general obligation bonds or gross receipts tax uh, revenue bonds because that reduces um, our bonding capacity for future projects and we don't know what's gonna happen. And we've just undergone this pandemic, right? We're trying to, um, we've got to move forward. We can't be afraid. We've got to do what's best um, for our Bernalillo County Fire Department our, and our sheriff's department. So, and also the key right now, we talked about it this a little bit before, is to promote economic development. And as with major construction projects, this public training um, academy, it will create construction jobs. And, and we really, really need that. At this critical time, our community, um, our community needs all aspects of rebuilding our local economy as we, <clears throat> excuse me, recover from this pandemic. So I just, you know, again, want to let you know that, you know, we have thought about this, as you know, we've met, I appreciate your time. Um, and I also want to let you know that we have um, uh, experts to here uh, to answer questions. So we have all our amazing staff who has done some amazing due diligence um, we have our external experts, um, including um, we have our developer, uh, Jerry Mosier and Jan Wilson, and Tyler Nunn, who's representing the contractor, uh, Bradbury Stam, to answer any questions that you all may have. So again, I just appreciate all your time. And thank you very much, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you. Commissioner Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam County Manager, I just want to thank you and your staff for all the meetings we've had um, for the last couple of weeks. Uh, I've been um, very engaged in this item specifically for a couple of reasons. One of, you know, as I 
uh, was meeting all of my constituents when I was running for office and, and continue to, their two biggest concerns are always lack of jobs, lack of job opportunity and crime. And so this, this is a huge one. Uh, we need to support our first responders and this is a good way to do it. I think it will help with, uh, it gives them the resources they need to train well. The fire department and the sheriff's department, they're the first on the scene for, you know, so many of these, uh, of the tragedies we read about every day in the, in the news. The fire department is also uh, responding with the sheriff's department in terms of behavioral health, uh, emergency service, um, having one location for both uh, departments, I think is great. Uh, my only concern has been um, just making sure that it was, a, uh, you know, the process that I went through. And, I, and I've been satisfied with these meetings. Um, the competitive bidding process was there. Uh, their, you know, our, our bond rating as a county is, uh, will be unhampered by this, which that's not a small thing. Uh, Ms. Reagan does a great job of uh, keeping us above the state. Our bond rating is above the state's level, um, above APS's level. So, uh, and this won't affect that. And um, yeah, so I feel very satisfied and uh, because we want to be responsible with our tax dollars, uh, but we also want to uh, put our resources into our first responders. And I think this will also help with recruitment, knowing that there's this, you know, new facility that they're not just working at a, you know, really just not adequate facilities. I think it will help with recruitment and morale. And so uh, um, that's, my, that's my thank you actually to our first responders and keep doing what you're doing and fighting crime and keeping our uh, behavioral health uh, issues de-escalated and, uh, and this will help do that. So thank you. Also, uh, Madam County Manager, I wanted to ask, you know, one project that I've been curious about is uh, um, the Sheriff's Department hangar. And so um, I know that being financially responsible, you decided not to include this in that. Um, I just wanted to ask if there was any other method of procurement that we could uh, do that because I know we're we're renting out uh, space in a again a subpar location. So, can you address that? Absolutely, Madam Chair and Commissioner Benson. So we've had discussions with um, under Sheriff Corin and I, um, and our Sheriff Manny Gonzalez. Um, with um, Kirtland Air Force Base, we've talked to the city, we've talked to the state of New Mexico, their Air Guard, to see if there's any possibility in doing some kind of like partnerships with them. And so far, we, you know, we haven't had any luck, but there's always hope and there's always, um, you know, they're, they're, they did express a willingness to work with us. Um, we've also, um, I also talked to staff yesterday, and I had asked if um, the developer perhaps had a piece of land that was adjacent to the public, um, this public safety academy that the county could perhaps purchase um, with um, we, maybe with some bond money that we have that I had talked to you about Commissioner Vincent and then uh, maybe come to you for maybe some, some funding for design so that we could at least get it started. So we've had had that dialogue. And I really appreciate the question because this is something that's very important um, to the county and of course to our sheriff's department and the community. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Casada. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just got one question um, to county manager. Uh, Mr. County Manager, uh, so after 30 years, we have the option to buy that, right? So um, after 30 years, my understanding is, and I think I'm, I'm going to kick it off to, let's see, who wants to take that? Lisa, um, my understanding is, is there's another five years that we can lease, um, if I'm, if I'm uh, I think I'm correct with that, correct, Dinah? Um, that, go ahead, Lisa. So, uh, Madam Chair, um, Julie, um, and uh, Commissioner Casada, 
Um, it is a initial 30 year term with an option for um, an additional five year term. So not to exceed a 35 year term. So at the 30 year term, um, currently um, based on the, um, the willingness of both the tenant and the landlord, we can open up negotiations um, for a new type of arrangement after 30 years. So there's no real talk of after 30 years, we could purchase it. There's no talk, there's nothing in that. Okay. Well, you know, no. I just, you know, I thought that would, you know, that would be a great idea down the line, right? Because we're trying to be good stewards, we're trying to get something quickly because we need it. We're desperately in need of it. But, you know, eventually it's really nice to, to own those facilities in the long run. Um, we just can't do it, you know, based on, where we're at uh, and with COVID and all these other things we got to crawl out of. But I just thought that, well, and then I guess the, the leaders of the county 30 years from now will have to figure that out. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm curious the way you worded that, Lisa. Um, you said other arrangements could be negotiated. Does it rule out buying it or? So it's really, it's a possibility. It's something, anything is on the table at that it, point? Um, Madam Chair, yes, um, it is. Um, at that point, um, if it is an, you know, an agreement between the, like I said, the owner and the landlord, um, the contract can be renegotiated um, after 30 years. And so renegotiated for another lease or to purchase for, for renegotiated for another lease up to five years but um you know I, I'm, I'm thinking that if both both the landlord and the owner are willing to discuss that type of an arrangement the opportunity is there after 30 years and okay. we also we, and, and Madam Chair, we also have um we have Ellen Wilson um he's the attorney for um, the developer. And we also have um, Kathy Davis, our real estate attorney, if they want to confirm um, what, I'm, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, if, if either would like to just answer that question, if, if that is a possibility to negotiate a purchase after the 30 years. Oh, Madam Chair, this is Alan Wilson, thank you. Um, the end of 30 years, the parties can negotiate any transaction they want. They can negotiate a purchase transaction, an extended lease transaction, a lease with an option, as Commissioner Casada suggests at that time. They can negotiate for any extended term that they want. Uh, there is no restriction in the in the current lease that we're that we've negotiated so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, um, Kathy Davis. Did you want to add anything to that? Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, I would just confirm what uh, Alan Wilson stated is correct, that, that any number of paths could be taken through mutual negotiations with the landlord and, and the county. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, are there any other questions from the Commissioners? Okay. I move for approval. Oh. Oh, wait, I'm not done. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I will make a note of that, that you have moved to approve. Um, yeah, I just wanna say, I think we all are in favor of our first responders, our sheriff's department, our firefighters having good training facilities. I just saw Chief Perez this morning at another event talking about our, our fire department mobile crisis teams, which is awesome for behavioral health. And I, I said, hey, chief, what do you think of that new training facility proposal? And he was, he was telling me why Bernalillo County really needs their own training facility because we deal with things that are outside of Albuquerque that are so unique that we really need to have a unique space um, to really get our firefighters um, really adequately, more than adequately trained. I know they're experts in what they do and deal with all different kinds of circumstances. So I am totally in favor of them having a top-notch facility for their training. I, for, on the BCSO side, I remember 
going to, I love Linda Stover's expression. She's like, what does she remember going to? I remember going to my new employee orientation, like my first week with the county in that old building on Harris. And I saw these young cadets running up and down the stairs. And I said, what are you guys doing? And they said, we're training. This is where we train. And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, this is our training facility. And I thought, okay, we need to get them a better training facility. Um, so I know we're all in favor of that. And I wanna say that, yeah, this item is a huge item. I had a lot of questions um, specifically about the terms of the lease. So I spent, a, Ken Martinez and I spent a good hour and 20 minutes chatting on the phone on Sunday afternoon about the terms of the lease and it looks like it was well done. There's safeguards built in for the county because who knows, 30 years is a long time, things change. So I just wanted to make sure that um, the conditions of the lease were written in a way to protect the county if need be. So I'm satisfied with that. Um, Commissioner Barbeau, I see you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. I'll be quick on Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. <laughs> I'm also thankful I got to sit with um, our attorney, Ken Martinez and Commissioner O'Malley and just sort of ask them the questions and really feel like um, I understand it better. And I think where possible and we're able to give that kind of better understanding to community I'm thankful for. I just want on the record, one of my questions, um, right, was both how are we thinking of this in the future? Like this is a 30 year public safety. And as we see our, community, our world is talking about how public safety includes behavioral health approaches. And like you mentioned, the mobile, the community engagement team. So how are we thinking of this training facility that's also meeting those needs and, and making the important connection between law enforcement and hopefully social workers and community engagement specialists. So just wanted that for the record since this is a 30 year public health and safety facility. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so Commissioner Casada moved for approval. Um, I'll go ahead and second since I have the floor. So all in favor, raise your hand. And Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Yes, ma'am. Let me make a quick correction. Since we deferred employee banking, it will change this financial resolution and it will now become 2021-68. Good catch. Thank you. Julie. <laughs> All righty. Commissioner Barboa. Aye. Commissioner Benson. Aye. Commissioner O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So, so that passed. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Whew. Thank you. On to <laughs> You're very well. And congratulations, Chief. <laughs> On to the next item uh, approvals. Our county assessor, Madam Assessor Tanya Giddings, is here to present about the fiscal year 2022 property valuation maintenance program and annual report for 2021. Take it away, Madam Assessor. Madam I Chair, saw you just a minute ago. Madam Chair and Chair and, oh. and Commissioners, uh, Clyde Ward uh, recently appointed Deputy Assessor. Uh, I'm speaking on Congratulations. behalf Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, Assessor Giddings is having some audio difficulties with uh, a semi-new laptop. So if we could uh, kind of delay uh, and get her presentation a little bit later in the meeting, would that be okay? She's uh, just having audio problems. She cannot hear you. Uh-huh. Oh, Madam okay. Chair, I, I, Madam Chair, I believe Madam Assessor has now joined us by phone. Awesome. Okay, okay. Are you ready to present, Madam Assessor? Yes, and um, I, I apologize. I apologize. Um, 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 can you hear me? Yeah, I go ahead. Yeah, we had a deep echo, but I think you're okay now. Okay, I apologize. Um, 
I, I see my screen. I don't see me on me on there. So, <laughs> um, good evening, uh, Madam Chair and County Commissioners. And uh, I'd like to also thank uh, uh, Clyde for jo joining in and helping me save the day. I'm here at the end, and here I thought I was completely prepared, and I'm having so many technical technical difficulties. So, um, but thank you for um, allowing me to present uh, my property valuation and maintenance program this evening um, at your last uh, virtual meeting, I should say. Um, but if I could quickly recognize um, my other team members who are on the um, on, on the Zoom meeting, I guess, with me is, of course, Clyde Ward, Deputy Assessor, who, who manages the appraisal side um, and IT, and Michelle uh, Aguilar, Deputy Assessor Michelle Aguilar, who an, um, manages the operations. Uh, Tito Chacon, who is our assessment manager. So they helped uh, myself along with the entire staff of the assessor's office compile this close to 30 page document that uh, by statute I must present to you and also ask uh, approval for on the valuation uh, funding of what will pay for the property valuation maintenance program. So if you'd allow me, um, if I could just say a few uh, words going into what, what we're presenting tonight. Um, so I am proud to present in accordance with um, an MSA 7-36-16 section E, the assessor's property valuation maintenance program for 2021. In order to maintain current and correct property values for the county, the county assessor must implement a program that includes collecting and maintaining relevant information in order to apply appropriate valuation methods. The property valuation maintenance program is funded statutorily through the property tax revenue and MSA 7-38-38.1 section B and to aid the Board of County Commissioners and the public in determining what the, whether the county assessor is operating an efficient property valuation maintenance program for the county and in determining the amount allocated for this function, the county assessor presents an annual budget and written report setting forth activities of the year evaluation improvements, new property to valuation records, increase and decrease of valuation, the relationship of sales prices of property sold to values of the property for property taxation purposes, and the current status of the overall property valuation maintenance of the county. The adequate funding for the program benefits the property owners of Bernalillo County, ensuring current and correct property values per the property tax code, for a fair and equitable ad valorem property tax system. So again, the goal of the program is to value parcels, which include residential, commercial, livestock, business, personal property accounts, and apply all legal exemptions, limitations of value, and special methods of valuation under the authority of the assessor. Um, program pur purpose. 285,794 rural property parcels and personal property accounts um, that were reflected in the 2021 notice of values that were mailed to property owners with the net taxable value of 17.9 billion. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to, of course, look over the valuation report, but if you don't, no, no problem. We make it available on our, our uh, website for the public to view um, uh, tomorrow. Um, but that information is on page 19. Uh, the operating budget I am requesting the approval for um, that would cover the maintenance program um, is 6.3 million and it's of course uh, from the valuation fund. Um, that is not an increase, it's, it's, uh, um, it's the same budget we've requested prior year, so no increase. Um, I, if I could, I, I would share my uh, report with you, but again, um, what our office is driven by is our property assessment calendar. Um, again, if you are looking at our report, that's gonna be on page six. Everything we do is driven by that calendar. Um, we have a staff of close to 99 staff members. Um, about, I think about, we have about uh, 41 appraisers, which are all um, certified appraisers from different various levels, from appraiser one to state certified as appraiser four. Um, that also makes up about 20, 21 assessor technicians. Um, 
we have about uh, 12 departments that manage various things from residential appraisal to commercial appraisal to um, exemptions uh, to quality control. Um, and then, but where I'm going to go straight into is our uh, annual data and statistical analysis, which is on page uh, 21 of our report. Um, actually, I'll start on, on page 19. So um, for 2021, we mailed out 285,959 notices of values. Um, and of that, we had a protest um, of 4,919. That was just a small increase from prior years. Um, the breakdown of that is for residential properties, we of 233,622 residential properties, we saw um, there was a lot of uh, residential sales this year. So we saw a 84.50% increase in value of um, of those of those 233,000 properties. 84% saw no change in value, and 14.32% saw a decrease in value. So for commercial apartment parcels, there's 19,057. Um, 4.68 increase in value. 74.41% uh, saw no change in value, and 20.91 they decreased in value. Um, another thing I always like to point out is part is, is page 21, which is assessed values versus the market values. We maintain two sets of values: um, market value based on analysis of prior year market activity for current and correct values and the assessed value for ad valorem purposes, recognizing the limitation on increase in valuation of residential property, which of course recognizes the 3% cap. Um, I would like to try to take this opportunity to um, clarify that there's this assumption we see by many property owners is that we raise values by 3% every year. It's an automatic, we're applying a 3% across the board and that's just not the case. As you could tell um, with the percentage breakout that I just gave of residential properties. Um, so overall, the average percentage of market-based cost values compared to assessed values in the county for 2020 was actually 80.93%. So we still have quite a few properties that are um, um, under market, but they're also under the limitation of value. Um, another thing I just wanna talk about is, is community outreach. Well, 2020, of course, we did not, we were not able to do any community outreach, but um, I think in all the years past that we've, we've done that community outreach, um, it, it was a benefit to the property owners in the fact that, um, you know, our, our office of course changed processes as all offices did. We weren't able to meet with properties one-on-one -on -one anymore but our intake of calls, our intake from emails, everything just increased in volume of communication with property owners. They had time to look at, look at their paperwork. They had time to look at our Okay, Madam Chair, it looks like Madam Assessor was disconnected. Okay. Um, Clyde Ward, would you like to take over? At this moment, I, I am not sure she was close to finishing and uh, asked for that approval. Um, yes, she just sent me a uh, text that said, can yes, you hear me? We, oh, now she's back. Oh, she's back. I cannot I hear any of you. Talk. I can <laughs> see heads nodding. <laughs> so I'm just going to finish it out. And I apologize. I uh, when you ask questions, I'm going to relay them to um, uh, Deputy Assessor um, Clyde Ward. 
Um, I think where I just wrapped up was, uh, hopefully you heard me talk about the walk-up window and what a wonderful resource that has been to our property owners. Um, you know, I wish uh, that I would have, we would have opened that up since day one of when I first got into, uh, was uh, fortunate to become the assessor. Uh, it has truly, I mean, been a, a wonderful um, opportunity for those property owners who do not have access to virtual means. And, um, and that's a huge part of the population that we, we've served. So, um, you know, uh, we're sad to lose it, but we're excited about moving to the new building. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful to facilities and Lisa to work with us so we can finish out using that um, walk-up window uh, as we transition to the next, uh, the new building as well um, until the, we're open to the public. Uh, I think hopefully you heard everything, but of course the property valuation maintenance program will continue to ensure compliance with the laws enacted by the New Mexico legislature in order to accurately and impartially value property in Bernalillo County within the timeline set forth in New Mexico property tax code. So again, I just wanna thank the team of the assessor's office, Clyde Ward, Michelle Aguilad, Mitchell Munnick, um, and uh, Tito Chacon and the entire team of the assessor's office who work really hard and are, I deal with the property owners one-on-one -on -one every day. Um, and uh, they do a phenomenal job in going above and beyond and helping them walk through the process of what the assessment process is. So they are an active participant in the valuation of their, their property and they know where their top, uh, property tax revenues go towards in helping our community. And thank you, and I stand for any questions for Clyde. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Madam Assessor, um, for all your work and for pushing through all the technology challenges this evening. I see Commissioner Casada has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, technology uh, has been uh, kind of a double-edged sword for us for a year and a half. Um, I, I have one question, um, you know, now that, uh, you know, the marijuana business is, is legal, um, I just have a question on how that's going to affect um, um, property values. And because uh, I know that there's, there's, uh, there's loopholes for like, if you grow alfalfa, you don't pay, you know, uh, I, I, I don't assume that's going to be the same for uh, the marijuana business. But uh, have you guys looked at that? And is that something that you're going to be considering going into the next year. Chairman and uh, Commissioner Casada, you know, we, we're always going to look at something new like this. You know, we have uh, a lot of questions ourselves and we, along with uh, the industry itself, are probably waiting on the legislative action in the form of regulations on what that really will mean to us as well. Because it's still, you know, it, it, it will be considered a crop most likely. And so it will have an agricultural climate to, you, to it as well, if you will, in regards to valuation. But uh, the jury is still out on a lot of those questions about uh, how we will actually see that. And the valuation date for the assessor's office is always 1 January. So depending on when this is all applies is how we will look at what it does to market impacts and how it does that. In Denver, they, they saw an increase in commercial properties because they were being purchased up for grow houses and they were having vacant properties repurposed for that kind of environment, but they also had a huge infrastructure hit. So I, I think along with that, when we do something this with this type of magnitude, uh, a lot of it is see how it goes and we will watch the market and value according to market on properties and then with guidance of uh, agricultural application of how that will apply. So I think uh, we still have uh, some good information to go with and we will be involved in that process for sure. Coming here from uh, one of the, lar well, the largest county in the state, we will be involved in that process. Thank you, Mr. Ward. I appreciate that answer. Okay, any other questions? If not, I will move for approval. Can I get a second? Thank you, Commissioner O'Malley. For a second, I thought Shirley Reagan was seconding, but I think she was just <laughs> scratching her head. <laughs> and there goes Commissioner Casada doing something. So. 
<laughs> All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Please call the roll. Commissioner Barboa. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Mr. O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. That passes oh, oh. unanimously. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the assessors team. Uh, moving on to real thank estate. You, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> um, ground lease agreement with the New Mexico Commissioner of Public Lands, Lisa Cedillo White, to present. Uh, Madam Commissioner, um, members of the commission, um, the agenda item before us tonight is. Uh, the motion is to approve the ground lease agreement between Bernalillo County and the New Mexico Commission of Public Lands for approximately 634 acres of land known as Mesa del Sol. Second motion is to authorize the county manager to execute any sub subsequent amendments to the ground lease agreement. Um, in 1996, a long time ago, Bernalillo County and the Commissioner of Public Lands uh, State Land Office entered into a ground lease agreement um, as stated before for 634 acres of land, um, the Mesa del Sol complex. The original ground lease agreement was for 25 years. It expired in May of 2021. We entered into a um, lease uh, amendment taking us through December 31st of 2021. The proposed ground lease agreement uh, will be for a term of, instead of 25 years, it'll be a term of for 40 years. And it will become effective on January 1 of 2022 and terminate on December 31st of 2062. The negotiated base rent will be 2,500 annually and a 19% of all revenue generated by Bernalillo County on any facilities um, there at Mesa del Sol will go to uh, the state land office. I do wanna say that all revenue that is received from Bernalillo County by the state land office um, is uh, for any of our facilities at Mesa del Sol is um, reappropriated to New Mexico uh, public um, education institutions in the state of New Mexico. So we're real excited to present this 40 year uh, ground lease agreement to uh, the county commission tonight. Uh, with that, I stand for any questions. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanna say thank you for this. I know that our New Mexico commissioner of public land, Stephanie Garcia Richard is always looking out for our community. She's such a wonderful person. So um, I, I would be honored to move to approve this item. Commissioner Barboa, was that a second? Okay. <laughs> okay, any questions? No questions, seeing no questions, all in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Barboa. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Mr. O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So and that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to sublease agreement with New Mexico United Soccer. Take it away, Lisa. Okay, Madam Chair, members of the commission. The next item is a motion to authorize the county manager to execute the sublease agreement between Bernalillo County and New Mexico United Soccer and any amendments or changes made by the State Board of Finance. This particular, um, once we have the sublease agreement uh, fully negotiated, we do have to present it to the State Board of Finance for final approval. I do wanna say that on February 8th, 2021, Bernalillo County and the New Mexico United um, entered into a field use agreement for the use of the Pro Practice Championship field which is located at Mesa del Sol Recreation Complex. The field use agreement expires on December 31st, 2021, or until a longer term uh, sublease is entered into. Uh, Bernalillo County, in partnership with the city of Albuquerque, 
um, through two intergovernmental agreements um, where the um, city is appropriating $3.5 million and the county has appropriated a million dollars to, in addition to the pro practice championship build to um, design, construct, um, maintain, maintain and operate um, in addition to the soccer fields, additional amenities there at Mesa del Sol next to the pro practice championship build. Um, which um, United would uh, be utilizing, which would be an official locker room, bathrooms, uh, landscaping, and of course on the facility, walkways and a parking area. Um, Bernalillo County currently um, has been in negotiations with New Mexico United to come to an agreement on the terms and conditions of the sublease agreement. Um, once, as stated before, once the final sublease agreement um, is negotiated, uh, we will have to present it to the State Board of Finance for um, their final approval. So with that, um, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, I stand for questions. Okay, any questions? I am seeing no questions. Um, I've never played soccer, ice hockey and softball were what kept me out of trouble. <laughs> so if somebody would like to make a motion to approve, I'd love to hear it. Thank you, Commissioner Casada. Is there a second? Commissioner Barboa, thank you. All in favor? And Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Barboa. Aye. Commissioner Benson. Aye. Commissioner O'Malley. Aye. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Don't go anywhere, Lisa Cedillo White. You're up next for a sublease agreement with Live Nation Worldwide Inc. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Once again, members of the commission. Um, the um, next item is um, to approve the sublease agreement between Bernalillo County and Live Nation Worldwide for the property located at 5600, uh, 5601 University Boulevard um, Southeast and recommend approval to the State Board of Finance. This property or Live Nation is also on the Mesa del Sol um, complex. Um, the second motion is to authorize the county manager to execute um, any subsequent amendments or changes made to the State Board of Finance. Once the sublease agreement is approved by the county commission, um, the, uh, we do have to present it to State Board of Finance. Back in 1997, Bernalillo County and then the contractor Niederlander of New Mexico entered into a sublease for approximately 10 acres located in the Mesa del Sol complex. Bernalillo County and Niederlander, jo Niederlander joined um, jointly financed and constructed the amphitheater, which we know as today um, as the Isleta Amphitheater. Since that, a few amendments were entered into um, and um, for uh, this particular agreement of uh, Live Nation is responsible for maintaining, promoting and operating the amphitheater for cultural and other live entertainment events um, of a wide variety. Um, the Isleta Amphitheater is owned by Bernalillo County, and um, of course the land is owned by the State Land Office. The is existing sublease agreement between Bernalillo County and Live Nation um, is due to expire. The current sublease agreement that we are under is due to expire on December 31st, 2021. The proposed sublease um, is for a term of five years with an option to renew for five additional years, or four additional years, excuse me. The negotiated guaranteed base rent um, is 338,000 annually. In addition, Live Nation will pay the county a percentage of tickets sold um, in the amount of $1.50, pay ticket for tickets sold up to 175,000 tickets, $2.50 per paid ticket for tickets sold up to 225,000 tickets, and $2.75 cents per ticket um, sold, um, greater than 225,000 tickets sold. The new um, structured lease is project, the projected revenue is expected to um, equal or exceed the current revenue that the county is receiving at $530,000 per year. We did um, obtain an appraisal 
um, on the um, leased um, arrangement and um, the appraisal came back with what the county um, negotiated was a fair and reasonable. Um, with that, uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, I stand for any questions. Okay, are there any questions? I see no questions. So um, as a concert lover myself, I will move for approval. Can I get a second? <laughs> Commissioner Barboa, <laughs> thank you very much. You gave a very cool second. And so all in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. <laughs> and Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Barboa. Aye. Mr. Benson. Aye. Mr. O'Malley. I think she may have dropped off the meeting. Okay. Vice Chair Casada. Aye. Madam Chair Piscotti. Aye. So come. That and passes unanimously from everybody here. And, <laughs> Still and Madam Chair, I, I do yeah. want to say we do have uh, representatives from Live Nation on the call. Um, they are very um, excited. Um, they, uh, the way they operate th their operations is they're wanting to start um, setting up um, venues, concerts for 22. 2022. So um, they they really needed to get the sublease agreement approved by the commission. So I'm very grateful for uh, Madam Chair and the commission for approving this item. We got it done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's it for our voting items discussion. The only thing I want to discuss is how great you all have looked on Zoom. And our next meeting is going to be live and in person. And I suspect we're all going to look even better live and in person. So I'm looking forward to that. I know we all are looking forward to seeing each other in the same place at the same time. And so we will get to do that on Tuesday, August 17, 2021. Our zoning meeting begins at 3 p.m. in the Ken Sanchez County Chambers. And following that on August 17 will be our administrative meeting at 5 p.m. And if there's no other business, I want you all to have a very safe 4th of July holiday. Have a good July. We won't be seeing each other in a big meeting like this, but we're gonna be ready to hit it in August. So everybody take care, be well, stay safe. Namaste.